In this video, I'm going to take the data from my copper 2 carbonate experiment where I decomposed basic copper 2 carbonate, which means that it's actually a combination of copper 2 carbonate and copper 2 hydroxide. Sometimes this is even called copper 2 carbonate hydroxide. You're going to need this data if you didn't watch that video to do the percent yield and percent error calculations and the stoichiometry that proves the theoretical mass. And then we're going to use this actual mass of the copper oxide product to calculate how well the lab went and the yield and the error. All right, so off we go. The first thing we're going to need is we're going to need those balanced equations. Most textbooks will tell you that the decomposition of a copper carbonate or copper 2 carbonate will produce copper 2 oxide and carbon dioxide, which is true, but the problem is you can't have or purchase this chemical pure. When you purchase it, it's actually a mixture of copper 2 carbonate and copper 2 hydroxide. It makes it complicated. However, it starts off with kind of this greenish blue color, just like I wrote here, and then it decomposes into a product, copper 2 oxide, that's black. It releases carbon dioxide and also water this time because of the hydroxide decomposing. So it's a great experiment for proof of chemical change with colors. The other thing is the mole ratio here changes to a two. That's very important. So one, two, one, one versus all ones. Also in the video that I did the uh, reaction in, I took some universal indicator, which has water and it was green. And I added, you know, I added it into the test tube and tested for carbon dioxide. And that proved I had carbonic acid because my universal indicator little Q-tip turned red. So that's the kind of the third reaction that I had in my video for the decomposition of copper to carbonate. All right, on to the math, on to the stoichiometry and the percent calculations. So I'm going to do those with you. Uh, make sure that you do look back at the fact that we're going to start this problem with our original, the 3.15. We're not going to use this right away until we need to calculate percent error and percent yield. Okay, so 3.15 is what we're going to start our problem with. And so you start that in the numerator of your calculation. Now, for sake of room, I'm going to write this chemical correctly one time. And then from now on, I'll probably just write it as copper uh, to carbonate, just to save some room. So you're going to start your problem with that mass. And I use these cards with my students. So I'm going to start with mass. And I just have them kind of turn that card over. And then we're going to convert that to something else, especially since we don't want that chemical. So this is where I'm going to, you know, do a little bit different. I'm going to use molar mass next. Um, I have my students use these. They can flip it around, and that would be wrong because of it multiplying grams by grams. So the molar mass I'm going to calculate would go in the denominator. I've already calculated it. These are the uh, elements that I had to use to calculate it. So I already did this ahead of time to save us some time. And so this is that chemical right here. I should write that in the denominator. But to save room, I'm just going to put CuCO3. And then per one mole of the CuCO3. Remember, I'm doing that to save some room. Then I want to be able to convert from one chemical to another. Every stoichiometry problem involves going from moles to moles. I just say A to B. And what we're trying to do is go from moles of this copper carbonate to moles of the copper to oxide, okay? So again, I'm gonna grab that balanced equation here and show you. Remember that's one to two. And remember, I'm kind of lazy about writing down that whole chemical. So then what I'm gonna do is use those mole ratios. I'm actually gonna switch colors just to show you. It's one to two, okay? And then next, I, don't, I do not, I do not wanna end with moles. I wanna end with mass. So I'm gonna use molar mass again, except for I'm gonna have the molar mass uh, number in the numerator and one mole in the denominator, and then it'll end up having grams as an answer or mass as my answer, okay? So that's kind of how I have my students use these cards. This is where the equal would be. And then I've already looked it up ahead of time again, just to save us some time. So if I had a whole mole of copper two oxide, it would weigh 79.55. So I hope I said copper two oxide. All right, remember, in chemistry, we don't use a, a mole that's a lot typically in a lab. If I would have decomposed 221 grams of copper carbonate, that would be a lot to fit in a test tube. So I used a lot smaller amount. So again, that's why we're using those over uh, one. 
And then I've already calculated this ahead of time. If you'd like to check, you can. Um, so what you'll do is, again, take your 3.15, you divide it by 221.11, uh, and then I'm gonna hit equals. That would be, I'm gonna stop here for a second, just in case you have to report the number of moles of copper to carbonate hydroxide. That would be it, rounding to sig figs would be 0 0.0142. Then I'm gonna multiply that by two. So this answer right here is the number of moles of copper oxide. So that would be 0 0.0285 moles with significant figures. Finally, we're gonna multiply that by 79.55. Looks good. And I get two point, and I'm only gonna keep three sig figs, 2.27 grams that were theoretically possible. Keep in mind, look how much smaller the molar mass is for copper to oxide than that uh, carbonate compound. So there's my final product, and then that has a name. Um, that's the theoretical mass. Theoretical. You know, um, that's all living in theory. Like That's the amount we should get if this works perfect. So in this case, if you look, um, I actually got... Uh, more than that by mass. That seems strange, but keep in mind the molar mass of this basic two copper two carbonate is actually quite large. So my guess is I probably didn't maybe heat it long enough to drive you know all that reaction to completion. So here's the percent yield calculation. Um, I have that actually defined here, this one. So percent yield, I just flip it over, I've got a little definition card, is the actual mass. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of put down here percent yield is the um, actual mass, that was what I got in the lab. For me, that was 2.28, let me show you one more time, right there, 2.28 grams. And this label should be the same. same, same unit, same label. And then I should have gotten 2.27. But again, my, my thought is I didn't maybe heat it long enough, I only did one heating. So if you divide those two, I won't show you in the calculator, hopefully you can do that on your own, you get 100.4 something, but with significant figures, I can keep just 100 with a decimal point to keep it to three. So, you know, in the end, I actually didn't do that bad with that lab. All right, next thing would be error. Um, if you take these two and add them together, percent error plus percent yield should equal about 100%. So whatever your, you know, glass half empty or glass half full is how I describe it to my students. So percent error, I'm gonna write that calculation down here, is you take the theoretical, that's the 2.27, and this is one of those times where that mass is smaller than what I actually got, but that's because my reaction probably didn't go to completion. It's hard to do. And then divided by 2.27. And if you check the error here, and because of it being so small, and then keeping three sig figs, um, there's my error, okay? So, you know, way up here if I carry that out farther, but I, that's four sig figs, and then more than that would have been way too many. The balance only allowed me to keep three sig figs because that's what I used. I didn't have a, you know, $10,000 balance. I had my nice, simple one. So there's the calculation for the stoichiometry. Uh, there's the percent yield. There's the percent errors.